Right, so I'm going to start it then. Um, hello, first of all, and um, thank you all for coming to, to the talk Cloud Foundry for Everyone. This talk will hopefully is intended to help people getting started with the, with the Cloud, Cloud Foundry platform and technology. And um, as you can see from the title right here, there are two names on the list. And as you can see on the photos here too, um, there's my colleague Myrna and, and the other one, that's me. <laughs> um, unfortunately, you can see that I'm standing here on my own and um, this has a bit of a sad reason. Um, actually, when we submitted the, the, the talk, worked on the talk both together and uh, got accepted. Unfortunately, after that, um, Myrna did get their, her visa declined and she was not uh, allowed to enter the United States. And um, that's something I don't, I don't find really good. But there is technology and um, technology can be better than those stupid immigration rules. And with that technology, we're actually able to bring Myrna in. So there's Myrna. Myrna, you can say hi and wave now. <laughs> And I, up, uh, the audio, okay. say again, please. We can hear you now. Okay. Hi. Okay. That's Hello, everyone. <laughs> well, that was loud enough. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, we, had, we didn't know in the beginning if this is going to work or not. So um, I'm going to do most of the presentation during that talk. And um, later on, we have a few steps of a live demo, and that's basically where I try to do some screen sharing with Myrna, and then she can do her, um, her part then. So I'm, I'm happy that, that, that this works, and um, let me then switch over to the, to the agenda. So as this is the one-on-one -on -one track, um, I figured a situation for people being very new to Cloud Foundry and, and interested in Cloud Foundry. So we try to summarize a couple of things which might, wait, uh, might make your life easier to get started. So by the time you leave that room again, I would like that everybody has a bit of an idea where can you get generic information and, and um, help about Cloud Foundry. I give you a bit of an insight on the basics of the technology, basically a couple of fundamental things that I think you should understand, uh, a bit of an insight on the uh, command line interface. I will also talk about the lovely Cloud Foundry community where I'm a proud member of, um, how they can help you um, getting things started or getting to learn things better and um, become a real master in that. Um, the majority of the talk will basically be to get a bit of an overview about the various Cloud Foundry options. So basically when you're new, new to, to it and then where you, can you start, how would you get your like, first deployment experience and so on. And also a bit of a lookout into the future. Uh, so, um, the way I started this, um, I'm besides my consultant job at, at Novatech and um, being and, and running the Cloud Foundry Meetup in, in the area of Stuttgart, I'm also teaching cloud native software development at, um, at a university there. And I had two students hired, um, and I basically gave them, I, I knew that they were new to microservice development, container technology, and Cloud Foundry, and things like Kubernetes in particular. So I just sent them out with the idea and said, please find out for me what is Cloud Foundry and how can you access Cloud Foundry? And the points they came back with about like two weeks or so and um, say that Cloud Foundry is an open source pass, cloud computing system, it's fast, easy, build, test, deploy and scale applications, um, supports many language runtimes, multiple different service bindings and so on. So most of those things we have probably already seen um, they found a very good video recording from Dale, Dave Nielsen from a former CF summit, which they said they provide a lot of help and uh, help them getting started as well. And then there was the point that made me particularly happy is when they said, we were able to push our first application to Pivotal Web Services. Like the first couple of bullets I kind of expected, the last one I didn't really, but it showed me that even without any guidance from my side, they were able to get there. And so with this talk, I will probably just try to recap a couple of the steps that they did and um, then continue on to that survey. So um, the, the way to get, to get started um, and get information, you probably all know that Cloud Foundry has a homepage. It's cloudfoundry.org. On that homepage, there's a direct link to a getting started section. 
that you can either find information or basically uh, say I'm ready to try and um, get started with, with, with doing some um, deployments. Now I'm not going to walk through the home to the home page. I mean that's not, not the content of this um, of this talk. So to give you a bit of a visual idea of my understanding of Cloud Foundry is like if you in a very simplified view, it's just like kind of a black box, right? Sorry, black box right there, and we have basically two groups of people interacting with it. There's developers and there's cons consumers. In the end, in a simplified way, the developer would push their application to the cloud. Uh, to the Cloud Foundry platform that will return a URL, and that is the consumer, that's something that the consumers can use to access that. If we look a little bit further under the cover, um, and I'm not going to go technically deeper than that, um, Cloud Foundry has a, a model internally which is very strongly or oriented at, at the 12 factor app guidelines and splits uh, the components basically into the categories applications and services. Applications is the part where the de developer deploys. This is where the magic command CF push comes in. Um, so the only thing the developer has to provide is the piece of code that will push the application into the runtime. Internally, um, a so-called droplet will be built. This is a combination of, an of the application code and the, the, the runtime for that. This runtime is being called build pack. So I think you've heard about build packs this morning in the keynote. Um, this is exactly where this comes in. Um, now, if that applications, if they have like connections to or need connections to something like a messaging service or a database or anything, any legacy application, this is the service side of, of, of Cloud Foundry. And the command to access, like to bind those services, as the name already implies, is CF bind service, which will then attach those backend services to your application, and you don't need to worry about like the individual connection settings and so on. So. This is something, and, and then, as I said before, a route um, or a URL will be like provided by the platform for the um, for the application logic to be consumed. This is basically the fundamental understanding that I would expect everybody to have um, to to move forward with this. Then there is this um, Cloud Foundry command line interface. This is like a generic API that you can use across all the various Cloud Foundry environments. Um, I've made a like. I try to symbolize that, that we have like potentially local Cloud Foundry installations like for development environment like I have on my machine. Then there are public options or you can run the Cloud Foundry installation in some larger data centers. No matter where you run it, the CLI will always be the same. And there's always this, uh, just a basic set of commands like pushing an application, scaling, listing the options for the services in the marketplace and then create and binding them. So it's, it's pretty easy. Okay. A few words about the community, and I can see a few community members sitting here and smiling. Um, we are here to help, um, especially the, the, the people on the left bottom is the so-called Cloud Foundry ambassadors. Um, we are here to get people started and getting people in touch with the platform. There is an open Slack channel, the code is on GitHub, there are mailing lists and so on. We also have a Twitter account. Um, there should be plenty of things to, um, to find out information in case you have any questions. Um, if you have any questions right after this talk, either grab the two people in front of me or, or talk to me. We'll be happy to, to answer that. At least we're going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try. They know it better than me. Um, now, on, there is also some free training material available. Um, if you go on the website, you will find trainings, guides, tutorials, certifications. The one I'm recommending here is the so-called Cloud Foundry for Beginners from Zero to Hero. It's a self-paced training class. It's free, and um, you should spend a bit of time on that. But after, after doing this class, you're pretty very well set to, um, to operate this from a, from a developer perspective. Um, a couple of people from the community have also created individual um, tutorials, learning materials, so there's the so CF Push Club. It's like a, a one-page kind of instruction how to um, deploy applications to um, Pivotal web services. This was done by Molly Crowder. I've talked to her the other day. She said she might actually expand that and to show how things can be done on different platforms too. Then there is the Tri Cloud Foundry website, which Steve Greenberg, the gentleman here in the front, has just set up. He basically started this. Um, in the same time as we try to prepare for the talk, so this came in very um, handy for us. So 
I'm just going to open it real quick for you. Um, and I really recommend everybody to try that. So in here, if you walk through that, you should basically get a similar experience than what I tried to bring across with my, with my, um, with my talk here. Uh, so it will list the requirements that you need to install. Then you can pick a provider. Here the, the list of the providers to get started with. Then install the CLI and do all the things. So I'm not going to walk through all of this, but I can definitely recommend checking this out. Um, this is a, a really cool thing. So, um, other than that, um, you will find plenty of things. The third example that I brought up is the um, Cloud Foundry Hello Worlds. So this is a free GitHub repository where you can find different Hello World applications written in the various languages that Cloud Foundry supports. And if you want to play with some of them, just like uh, pull the code and, and push them to the platform. Okay, so, so much for the basics and, and introduction things. So now, when you say you're ready at the point, I want to play with the platform now and I want to and I want to use it, what kind of options do I have? Um, this was basically the task that I gave to the student to evaluate after they had done the initial, the initial learning curve. So basically, as you saw in the picture before, you have like options in a, in a local way where you can think, run things on your machine, you have public provider options and you have hosted options. Now, if you're getting just started, the hosted option is probably not the right one to start with because that means like a large scale in installation. And if you want to just want to play a little with it in order to get familiar with that, I would recommend to start with either the local or the public options. So the local options, um, there are basically three. There is the so-called uh, PCF dev. This is like a single node Cloud Foundry um, instance. It has the full functional scope from a development perspective, not so much from an operator perspective because it's just a single node, so there's no failover on the, on the infrastructure side. Um, but um, basically, you can use it uh, as, as a full uh, PCF. It has a basic amount of services for database, messaging, caching, and it's free. You only need to register at Pivotal to, to pull that. There is a similar version of this from based on the open source version of Cloud Foundry. This is called the CFDEV. This runs currently only on Mac OS and Windows 10. Um, this is also free, doesn't require any registration, and you can pull it directly from GitHub. Um, the third option is the so-called CF local option. This, however, is not a real Cloud Foundry runtime. So, but you will find that in the local options, so it, it runs the droplets, basically the pieces that you build in containers, and it's, in my opinion, it's more suitable for local testing and debugging. So if you really want to get started with the CF push experience on, on your local machine, I, I would probably start with uh, PCF dev and CF dev first. Now, looking more at the public options, you can see there is a list of certified providers on that web page. Um, now, most of them also provide a public offering or a free trial offering for everybody to, that wants to get started. Not all of them. I mean, the one that I have highlighted uh, is, are the ones that I'm not going to do, like, I'm not going to be able to show in depth today. Basically, Atos is currently changing their trial offering and it's undergoing a change, so we were not able to, to test this at the time. Cloud.gov is, um, is available only for, I think, governmental and educational institutions in the US. That kind of made it a bit difficult for us to test. And um, SUSE is more, uh, it doesn't have a public provided cloud in, in, in the same way as, as, as the others would have. They are more focusing on integration Cloud Foundry with Kubernetes and rolling that out um, in your local data center. They're working on that. I've talked with them yesterday, but there's nothing I can, I can talk, tell you about that yet. So we must mostly going to focus on PWS, IBM Cloud, Swisscom, and SAP. In addition to that, we also uh, took any nines into the to, to play. They offer a really easy to consume service, and, and which is very suitable for trying. So PWS in the first place, this was also the, the one that my students discovered as the first one to, to test. Um, this has probably the, um, the, the, the biggest market adoption, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. But basically, the feedback that I got from them is it's very easy and straightforward to use. So it was, even for beginners, really simple to get, to get their applications deployed and, and, and the service instantiated. I mean, the reason why I did this experiment with the students was just like, if I know if I had pulled this together, 
my focus would, or my viewpoint would already be very biased because I got that background experience. So in particular, I wanted to have somebody which is really new to that. So when, with, with the, the flavor that, that um, PWS um, basically provides is like, it's, kind of, it's very, pretty much focused on um, microservice development. So you got your backend services like databases, messaging, caching, and streaming. Um, and explicit support for like Spring and Spring Boot application, like a circuit breaker, or config server, or registry. Um, SAP is also, the, the comment that I got, this was the smoothest user experience. I don't know exactly how that differs from very user friendly, but I, I guess both of them were really nice. Um, so from, a, from, a, from, a, uh, from, from that level, that it was a similar positive experience. They have a standard set of build pack. The differentiator here is they have like some offerings for HANA, Watch, or their machine learning called Leonardo. So this is basically how, how it works in general. Um, all those three tiers offer a kind of a standard set, and each different company has kind of their own backend services for the, for the users to consume. In particular, IBM. IBM has by far the largest set of, um, of services available. Uh, there are things for IoT, uh, in, in the Watson side, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. This IBM Cloud Foundry also comes in two options. Um, there's the global Cloud Foundry platform, which was initially known as, as Bluemix. And there's the so-called Cloud Foundry Enterprise Edition. In that case, you're going to get your own dedicated cluster of Cloud Foundry nodes. However, the second option is probably not the right one for you to start. So the feedback that I got from my student um, at that point was um, they got everything running, but it wasn't as intuitive as the others. Um, most likely the reason is this is only one subset of the overall IBM Cloud offering. And, um, they had some various CLI tools like the Cloud Foundry, then the Bluemix or an IBM Cloud. And they got a little bit confused by that initially. In the end, when they had worked through that, they got their thing running and the user experience was just the same. Um, any nines uh, has a really fast registration process. And um, the thing we noted there is even in the registration page and in the invitation email, you get your CF push instructions straight away. So um, this is pretty much the, the fastest uh, application to platform experience that we had. Also very easy and very user friendly. Um, Swisscom is another um, alternative based in, based in Europe. The, the kind of difference that we found out here, they have this um, free tier only available for individuals in Switzerland. Um, the other, other people would require some kind of company registration, to, but still getting the free tier then. So as um, I was able to sign up there without any problem. After that, after registration, same is very easy, good, good friendly documentation, and um, very positive experience here as well. As I said before, SUSE is basically listed as a, as a certified provider, um, working very much to running their containers in, in Kubernetes. Everything is open source. Um, but no real uh, public cloud that we, could, that we would be able to show, show right here. So this is a bit of an overview um, by which means they, uh, they differentiate. I mean, some, most of them are the trial offerings are scoped by duration. So the um, Pivotal, SAP, and Swisscom offer 90 days, any nines offer 30. The, the big exception here is IBM. This is a trial offering that basically never expires. Um, on the other side, IBM offers the least amount of, of volume. So it's like you can run very small services over a longer period of time, but you cannot do bigger things like in the, in the other trial versions. SAP was the clear winner here with four gigabytes of RAM. All the others have one and two, except Swisscom has, you have like a, a monthly volume given in Swiss francs, um, and you can deploy as much as it, as it, uh, until it comes to, um, to, that, to that limit. Build packs are mostly the same. As I said before, uh, there's a standard set of build pack that pretty much everybody has. And um, each provider has maybe one or the other certain build packs specified to, to, uh, to a, a certain need. In IBM, you, for example, get a um, IBM Liberty build pack um, as a standard offering. For the other ones, you would have to take this from a, from a community build pack resource. So there's not much difference there. Where there is a lot of difference, you can really see that in, in the services. IBM is leading that by far. Um, and um, 
this is also quite a, <laughs> quite a challenge to understand what they all do, but um, a, lot, a lot of them are there. And, um, and the other ones are roughly in a, in, a, in a scope of like 10, 20 services which you can consume for that trial offering. Okay, so now we'll try to demo this a little bit. And um, for that, I want to see if Müller is still here. Right. So you're still there. I'm going to switch this on. Can you say something quickly so we can hear you? No. My screen? Yes, okay. Well, I'm going to... Um, yeah, you can share your screen in the, um, in the Zoom meeting now. Let's see if that works. Yes. So, can you see, all see that? No. Uh, can you increase your font by any chance? Okay. Or is it, is it the size? Oh, is it better that, is it better that way? Okay, we changed the lighting, Mirna. Um, it's still okay. a little small. Um, I don't know, it's not working. But okay, I mean, I think it should be okay like that. I mean, in, in the end, um, we're just going to push an application. We take the same application and push it to a couple of clouds. Um, and so once you show it from, from once you show the web page, that should be fine. Um, so I, I would say just, just go ahead with, with doing that. We have about like okay. eight, minute, eight minutes left. That should be okay. So you, you can talk. But initially, we didn't think we have an audio signal. Okay. And, but now you can, you can speak to the people. <laughs> so if you hear me well, um, I will try to use uh, Swisscom and any ninth as providers here. And uh, since I'm already logged in to Swisscom to save some time, we'll show the services available there using the CF Marketplace command. So we can see a couple of them here. We can see the service name, what are the plans that are available there. And here it's important to, see, uh, to say that uh, some providers offer only uh, specific plans for trial accounts. So you have to be aware of that. And you can see the description and so on. We can also see which build packs are there. You forgot a D, I think. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and here we can see also a set of uh, build packs that was offer. And uh, I'm going to say that we have already pushed the application to Swisscom. Uh, we have bound it to a database service and uh, scaled it into two instances. I'm not going to show the steps for that right now, but it's already there. I can show that with the CF apps command. So we have our simple web application in the started state with two instances there. With the CF services command, we can see that we have a database service which is bound to our uh, application. And right now, I'm going to switch to any nines as a provider. I, do you want to show this running in the browser first, or do you want to? Oh, but maybe that's a good idea. To change the provider, do the push, and then show the browser. Okay. So this is based, as a background, this is basically what we pretty much did with all the various providers, basically figure out um, how, many, how many services do they offer, uh, how many build packs are available, and um, what Myrna said is, is, is important to repeat. I mean, you, you might see all the services, but not all of the services come for in, in, in a free trial version. So most of the databases or messaging providers have a... Um, uh, a, a small kind of test service, which is, which is free as a trial, um, but the advanced versions will most likely cost something then, which is also kind of understandable. But as Myrna said, especially if you have already, I mean, put down your credit card account, um, be careful with creating that services. I remember I tried a RabbitMQ instance once and I suddenly had $300 on my credit card um, without any further notification. 
Um, this, this can happen, um, so make sure you uh, look at, at, the, at the trial versions there. Okay, so I can, Mila, you can. So, yeah, I've, I've looked into any nines right now. I will uh, show the services available there again. So we can see a different set of services compared to uh, Swisscom. And regarding the build bugs, we can see also a list of build bugs here. And here I'm going to uh, show the steps of pushing the application with the CF push command. And uh, it's important to uh, mention here that we're not going to um, determine some attributes like the application name or number of instances, the memory limit, and so on, since we've already created a manifest file where we already uh, determined all of that. So we're just going to uh, execute the CF push command. We can see that it auto uh, automatically detects this manifest file and uh, take, takes the uh, attributes from there, like the application name, the number of instances, the memory limits, and so on. OK, so you can maybe start showing the browser with the Swisscom. So we have like three or four minutes to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, the, the idea that we had for this demo was just basically we used the same application and I'm about to show the same steps on like Pivotal Web Services and SAP and just to see that it's basically the consistent behavior across the board. And so you stopped screen sharing, right? Yeah, I will, I will share my uh, browser. Okay. So can you see it right now? Yes, we can see that. So okay. Looks familiar, so, uh, doesn't it? <laughs> this is the application on uh, Swisscom. We can see the provider name uh, with the API endpoint here. And uh, here is the application instance index. And since we uh, already scaled our application into two instances there, with the refresh, we can see that the uh, application instance index will change between 0 and 1. So that's yeah, sorry. basically okay. the Cloud Foundry load balancing mechanism. And a, a quick word about that application. A, another th thanks to Steve. This is uh, the basic source code we got is that Steve uses for his Cloud Foundry trainings here at the, um, at the Cloud Foundry Summit that you can, can also take. We just extended it a little um, to basically identify the provider name and display it there as well. Um, so you can see um, which cloud we're basically connected to. So when Myrna will just like basically point to the application deployed on, um, um, what did I want to say, any nines, then any nines. this provider yeah. name should, should look different. So yes, so I will show that. In the meantime, I can start doing new things on my own. So I have the same source code um, in, installed here. Currently, I am logged in to um, basically my local environment. So Myrna basically showed it on to, to push the application to, uh, to public cloud providers. I'm having a local PCF dev running right here. So as you can see, the behavior is exactly the same. Um, it, it's, it's a full full version of Cloud Foundry. You don't, you don't need the network access in the same way. So this is something you can easily try if you want to do that locally. Um, but maybe we... I just finished the presentation and we're going to have a look at that then. Um, so for the future, to, uh, today you have seen uh, Jules talking in the keynote about Irene. And I think uh, I'm really looking forward for this product, project to mature, same as with the Cloud Foundry containerization, because right now um, there are many uh, Kubernetes options easily available. And if we have something to just like plug Cloud Foundry into that, that will open up a wide new range of, uh, of options for people to, to get in touch with Cloud Foundry easily. And um, yeah, besides the things we said before, we also have their companies dedicated to work on Cloud Foundry. You will find most of them 
at the at the foundry with a sponsor booth. Um, they are companies. Once you are be beyond the level of doing your initial CF push, you once you want uh, want to use it in production and want to get help. So these are the ones that I have already a personal experience with, and I can definitely recommend. So I'm not going to read through all of those, but um, this presentation is recorded. Uh, you can definitely look them up later or, or ask me. I can def I can send you the link to all of them. And finally, I just want to say thank you very much to Himanshi and Ritu. Those were the two students that helped me uh, and Myrna doing all the survey. And again, to Steve, this time covered in a, with sunglasses, but it's the gentleman right here. <laughs> Uh, now this is, I got it. My, my time is up. <laughs> uh, so um, we can basically see here now, or should be able to see here now, that um, this application has started. So if I open this up in my browser, um, basically open a new browser window, should, yeah, it's just a little, so you can see here the provider name has changed in that instance now. This is pointing to my, to my local environment. I have only one inst in that instance running and it's connected to only to an in-memory database. But as you can see, it's, um, it's very easy to do that. And no matter which cloud you're, you're pointing to, it's always going to behave in the same way. So um, Myrna, do you have, uh, where is it? Okay, I, we can see your screen again now. Um, and this is the, pretty much just the same thing on, on, on her browser for, for that other account on, on any nines. Um, and with that, we're basically at the end of what we wanted to show. Um, and I think I run a little bit over. So are there any questions right now we can take? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So the question was, what kind of an, if I got it correctly, what kind of an impact do I have uh, when I look at services when I switch to cloud provider? Um, as basically the application side is nothing you would really want to worry about because that's that's being um, backed by the, by the build packs. I mean, the answer is of course it depends. <laughs> um, if you use some service which is really a very uh, only available at, at one very provider, um, you will most likely not find it at the other one. And then you have like a major migration effort. If you have something like, for example, Postgres SQL as a database backend, which most of the providers have a service for, then it will be easier to migrate data from one provider to the other. I mean, this is the, the, the typical vendor login kind of problem, pro, problem that you have there. So um, in case you don't need a certain specific functionality, I would try to stick to something which is available in, in a broader way. But I mean, if, if you use IBM Cloud, for example, because you want to consume some kind of their Watson services or whatsoever, then this is the, the reason why I need that cloud. Um, if you want to sw switch to another one, then you will want, we won't find a service there. I mean, maybe you can connect via the network to consume only the service and run your application in another, another provider. Um, that would potentially work, but it's nothing that you would say out of the box. I mean, you just can't move like the services around because they're like a part of your Cloud Foundry apps installation. Right. Yeah, you could do that um, because what you, you're consuming with the tier marketplace, tier free service, is um, that the Cloud Foundry platform has some API it knows about, um, which offers this service to create one for you or give back credentials for your apps. And um, you can also, as a customer, if it isn't uh, blocked, uh, introduce base code service, uh, service brokers. So you can provide for this space an API that says that. You can then see in the marketplace of that space to consume that. So it is possible for you to bring your service. But it's, uh, let me say, it, it's not the easiest way to do. Um, the consuming of these which are there is much more easier. Um, you have to have knowledge then about um, running that service. So it gets really more complicated. It's, um, and you have the problems with network traffic between your service, wherever you hosted it, and the, the platforms. So maybe if you have 
Christian, maybe we yeah. can take this discussion outside because yeah. I already can see the next speaker, and I, I, I always hate it if I only if I don't have enough time to prepare. So, first of all, thanks for listening and coming. Um, thanks for Myrna for staying up all night because it's very late in Germany now. Um, I'm glad you could participate a little bit, and that's it. Thanks a lot.